God, we just thank you for this day. We just thank you for the opportunity to hear John speak and you speak through him. And we just thank you for the opportunity to gather. Uh, we've been gathering for months now, Father. I know you've, you've touched a lot of men uh, on this call and we just continue to pray for your favor here. And we just thank you for the ladies that are joining in as well. And, and just be with us during this time. Be with John as he speaks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I'll introduce John. Uh, John and I um, have just recently met. We had dinner the other night and just started talking. And, and I asked John to, to speak tonight based on uh, what he does. And he was, I mean, just immediately said yes. Didn't even hesitate. So certainly appreciate him doing that. But uh, John is the president and CEO of the, Glo the uh, Greater Europe Mission Board. And uh, so we're just excited to have him on here. Um, he's got uh, some uh, great qualifications. And I tell you what, uh, I was reading through his bio and just going, wow, this is some really good stuff. In 2014, he was appointed CNN he Hero of the Year. And in 2015, by the Queen, he was given the British Empire Medal. So guys, we're, uh, we're in for a treat here tonight. So yeah, Mike Beeson is doing this. So we're not we're done. No, hey, hey so. Beeson likes a genuine fleck like the Queen. So go ahead, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mr. John Burns. John, we're excited to have you. Well, thank you. It's a real honor, actually. And um, it might be difficult for us because I don't speak American, and my guess is you guys don't hear in English. So we'll, we should probably have like uh, Netflix. We should have like little expressions along the bottom so you can understand me. And, uh, and I do get a bit excited at times and speak too quick. So just hopefully enough words and then fill in your own blanks to make it the talk you need to hear today. And um, it, it's great you mentioned that, Dan, because uh, weirdly I decided to go back to a talk I wrote three years ago, just this morning. And I thought, you know what? I haven't spoke on worth the risk for ages. And I just felt it was right for you guys tonight. So I didn't know you were going to mention the book. I didn't know you'd read it. But here's a few thoughts um, I want to share with you. Let me just introduce myself with a, a little story. Um, probably three soccer stadiums changed my life. God interrupted me three times in soccer stadiums. The first one really was when I was with my grandfather and I was eight years old. And my grandfather, hello, Leslie. <laughs> sneaking in. Um, my grandfather was a huge soccer fan and took me to Middlesbrough, my local team. And we were playing a team called Everton and uh, the striker, the main forward for Everton, scored a goal against our team. And my grandfather stood up and started clapping the wrong striker. And the reason he did it was this guy had just scored 50 goals in a season. It had never been done. It's only been done since by Ronaldo. And my grandfather just knew it was the right honourable thing to do, is recon, recognise him. Well, I'm eight years old and I'm suddenly learning new words as all these people are shouting and swearing at my granddad, right? And I'm, I'm trying to pull him down like, granddad, we're going to get our heads kicked in, sit down, sit down. And he's just, no, just clap, clap, clap. And it seemed like an eternity, and of course it wasn't, till eventually other men start standing, it was only men in stadiums back then, one by one joined him. And I kind of, uh, I got to speak at his funeral. I remembered what that did put in me, that if, if uh, good people are prepared to take a risk and do the right thing courageously, people will follow. The next stadium that changed my life was when I was 17 and Dr. Billy Graham came to the Northeast to do an evangelistic crusade. And he was preaching actually up at my uh, neighboring stadium, Sunderland. They were like our mortal enemies. So me and my crazy friends, I wasn't a follower of Jesus at this point in my life. And uh, me and my crazy friends jumped on the Baptist church's bus, went up there because I knew you got this chance to become a Christian. And so I told my friends, let's all pretend to become Christians and we'll steal turf off the field because they're our enemies and that'll show them right. So actually my wife, uh, Sandra, she was actually on the same bus because she was on the counseling team. I was on the steel turf team. Anyway, we went along six nights in a row and one by one, my mates got saved and I was the last of them. I was the last of them because I knew it was all or nothing. My uh, parents were committed Christians and church planters. My grandfather had got saved when he was 45 and had been a church planter. And so I knew if I was in, I was all in. And I knew what that cost would be like. And so at the age of 17 in a soccer stadium of the enemy, Sunderland, I gave my life to Jesus. A year later, I got called into full-time Christian ministry at a, a conference. And so I went to work. Um, eventually, I was a policeman for a while and then worked for the Lord, working for a church and then a couple of youth ministries. 
And I had this uh, habit on the side where I used to go and watch soccer around the world. And I was in a stadium called Stadio de Luz, which means in the presence of the light in uh, Portugal. And England were playing France in the middle of the second half. I had this kind of epiphany moment, really. And maybe it was the Lord. I'm assuming it was the Lord. And I kind of asked myself the question, what if I'm the only evangelist in this stadium? There was 45,000 England fans there and a 65,000 crowd. And I remember falling into my seat going, Lord, leave me alone. It's my only hobby. You know, I want to just have this one little bit to myself. And started to think, well, how would I reach them? How would I reach? Probably not like Billy did. So how would I reach the football fans like me? And so we started an organisation called Lions Raw. And it was that organisation 15 years later that I got the award from the Queen and CNN for us. We started to use soccer for social change. We took, we got Christian guys to take their non-Christian friends on basically humanitarian mission trips. And, uh, and it was an incredible, incredible 20 years. And eventually that's what brought me here to America. I tell these stories because I want you to hear, I want you to hear an undertone in it. And that undertone is about risk and courage. You know, starting an adventure with Jesus is taking a risk when we get saved, right? You know, committing yourself to full time, Lord, whatever you want me to do, whenever you want me to do it, making him Lord is a risk. I've had all kinds of risks I've had to take in my life. And uh, a very wise man once said, faith is spelt R-I-S-K. Faith is spelt risk. And, you know, um, all of us have to take risks all the time. Some of us are a bit risk averse, if we're honest. But sometimes the Lord interrupts us and calls us to take a risk. If you've got your Bibles, let's open it at Nehemiah 1 and 2. Probably one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I'm sure you've looked at it a million times. I'm going to flick through and pick out a couple of key things. But you'll know the story. It's the, the Jews are in exile. And uh, Nehemiah, we soon discover at the end of this first chapter, has risen to a pretty high position in the local government. Um, but of course, he longs for home, as I do. I'm heading back there next week. He longs for home and wonders what's going on in Jerusalem. He, he probably hears that the temple's getting rebuilt. It's probably happening around the time of the book of Ezra. And, um, and then news comes, and we'll pick it up at verse 2 in chapter 1. Han and I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down. Its gates have been burned and destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and I wept. In fact, for days, I mourned, fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. And then I said in this wonderful intercessory prayer that I'm sure you've read before where he tries to persuade God to do what he believes is the right thing, confesses his sins and, and asks the Lord, you pick it up there and just at the end of verse 11, oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those who delight in honouring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favourable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was cupbearer to the king. You probably know this, but, you know, the cupbearer to the king wasn't like the lowly servant. It was the most trusted servant. This guy's basically the prime minister to the king. He gets, you know, the last guy to taste the wine at night before the king tastes it, in case anyone's trying to poison him. He's a trusted advisor. He's in the king's ear. Probably this was the king that, if not physically destroyed the walls of Jerusalem that he just heard about, he certainly gave the order. You certainly get permission. And so we pick it up in, in verse two. And, and the point I want to just make here is when God moves us about something, when God speaks into our heart about something, the right first response is prayer. You know, it should move our hearts. You know, I, it, it's only a few times in my life where I've been as moved as he is in chapter one, where, where I wept and I cried and I fasted for days and I mourned. There's been three or four occasions like that in my life. And then eventually you find the words. You know, sometimes prayer is the natural response. Sometimes it's so deep, the pain we might be feeling on behalf of someone else or a global situation, that actually it's a few days before we can even find the words. We just feel it, as Nehemiah does. And then he says, grant me favour, Lord. 
Let's pick it up at chapter two. Early the following spring in the month of Nisan, not just a calm maker, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified. Let me pause that there. You don't look sad to King Artaxerxes. He's the psycho killer of Persia. You know, if you watch that terrible movie 300, that's him, right? He, he just takes people out. And to even turn up with sadness in his eyes, wrist his head being cutting off. No wonder he's terrified. And so he replies, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, well, how can I help? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it pleases the king and if you are pleased with me, send me to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king asks him some questions and gives him the money and the letters of recommendation and sends him. This is risk like I've never known. This is, this is what being driven to your knees leads to. When, when something moves in our heart so deeply that we are moved that deeply to real intercession, God rarely leaves us on our knees. He often gets us to stand up and start to become the answers to the prayers we've prayed. Uh, footnote, be careful what you pray for, because <laughs> you might start to become the answers to those prayers. I had a situation like this in my own life that I don't talk about, and I'm sure this isn't getting played out anywhere. But uh, 2007, uh, I went to South Africa for the first time, and we were planning to do a big football project there with this Lions organization in 2010. And literally my second day in South Africa, I met a Zulu chief that was about to be enthroned, and he asked me if I'd go to his ceremony on the Saturday. And so myself, another English guy, and a BBC camera crew were the only white people with 25,000 Zulus in the Valley of a Thousand Hills just inside Durban. And the reason we were there was God had broke our heart about the AIDS issue, particularly amongst young African kids. And we'd chosen this valley because we'd worked out it was the world's epicenter of the AIDS epidemic. And we knew the World Cup was coming to South Africa and we said, Let's go there. You know, the World Cup's going to pass these kids by. We know the soccer obsessed. Let's go there and just befriend these kids. And as we started to look at it, we realized there was some things we could do about sexual health and education. But we also knew that the Zulus, and you won't like to hear this, but this is what they believed. They believed AIDS was invented by Americans to keep black people down. That's what they believed. At the same time, they believed the higher you were in society, the more women you're allowed to have. And so it was, uh, you know, that's why AIDS went rampant through Africa. Anyway, long story short, I could tell the story for hours, but I go to this enthronement ceremony and the Zulu king turns up. And after the end of the ceremony, I get asked to go and join the king, the mayor of Durban, and this chief Mlaba in a little private tent. And they asked me, um, what do you think of Zulu culture? I said, well, I've only been here three days, but it's amazing. I love, I love, I love everything about it. And, uh, and they said, well, what do you think needs to change? to stop the spread of AIDS. And uh, I tried to bottle out a bit. I said, well, to be honest, I don't feel qualified to answer that question. And the Zulu king, the only thing he's ever said to me, he said, well, you're here, so answer. And I instantly felt like Nehemiah in front of the king, like this could be my head chopped off here. <laughs> you know, I get this wrong. You know, am I gonna challenge the 18 wives he's got? And so the only answer, and I think it was the Lord gave me the words, I said, um, well, I think it's good to be passionate, but we need to be passionate about the right things. It's good to fight, but we need to fight against injustice. And I think sex is great, but it's meant to be with one woman for the rest of your life. And in the back of my mind, I thought, these were the last words of John Burns. You know, it's like, off with his head. And actually, it was incredible, the reaction by them. We got invited into the into the area. You know, people thought it was too dangerous to work there. The Zulu King promised me would be under his protection. And he said, help us, help us change. And it was the start of an incredible journey. It still goes on today. We still feed 10,000 kids in that valley every single day through donors that help us through Lions Raw. And we go back every year with about 50, 60 guys and build another school and something else. 
I think serving the Lord is worth taking a risk for because he started it, right? You know, look, you look at the cost of Christ in fulfilling his calling and mission. You know, he emptied himself of everything, emptied himself of heaven, came to earth. We're about to celebrate as this helpless child in a smelly stable, emptied himself of all his regency and became like nothing. Why? Well, because you're worth the risk. You were the worth the risk to him. Or I'll picture Christ in the garden as we remember at Easter and he's driven to his knees and there's blood, there's sweat from his head. And he says, you know, Lord, if you can take this cup from me, take it. But not my will, but yours. Well, why? Why take such a crazy risk? Because you and I are worth it to him. Yeah, risk's difficult for all of us. But God regularly interrupts us if we allow him to. He moves us out of our comfort zone, physically, geographically, relationally. He calls for faith. Take a risk. I was working for Lions Row here in Dallas in 2014, and, and I got interrupted again, and the refugee crisis hit in Europe, and Great Europe Mission asked if I'd become their new president, and I didn't want to do it, but I just felt the center of what the Lord was about to do was in Europe, and I'm asking him, well, why did you send me to Dallas? And my only answer was, you know, send people to Europe. And so I lead this wonderful organization that's 70 years old and has 350 missionaries and 500 staff in 24 countries, and we're crazy about reaching Europe. You know, Europe's in turmoil with immigration and politics and the economics. And it's been really hard to reach. I actually would argue, and I do argue with people all the time, it's the most unreached continent in the world. Yeah, there's loads of churches, but from the point of view of committed evangelical Christians, it's under 2%. Right? If you look at the whole place, most countries are like 1%. I believe in the global South and in South America and Asia, there's a tipping point. You know, the gospel is on the move. But in Europe, it's, it's thin pickings. And yet even now we're starting to see some first fruit. You know, since that whole refugee immigration, we're telling stories all the time of Muslims that are coming to faith as they hit the shores of England, usually through dreams and then meeting a welcoming church and faithful Christians, lots of whom have been interrupted and taken a risk to go and work with people they may naturally be scared of. People who are driven to the knees because they were desperate for people to meet Jesus and then he decided not to leave them on their knees for long. Get up, go, be the answer. And so we're looking for people all the time that will take a risk, people that will take a risk in prayer and commit to it. I'll probably let Charles talk more about that in a few weeks' time. We're looking for people who will give, give money and give their time. People who will come with us, come on a short-term team, perhaps even some that will tie their retirement and come for the long term. We've been talking to Mike Beeson and another mission pastors about this idea of a 10-2 legacy project where we invite people over the age of 50 to come do six weeks with us in Europe and see if the Lord might be calling them to be invested as prayers or payers or even players. But as you know, the call of God is not just around the world, it's around the corner, isn't it? You know, I've just found myself living near Tim here in the tribute and I absolutely adore it. And as we've pushed into our neighbours, we're seeing the turmoil in our own neighbourhood. We don't have to go to Europe to see it. The loneliness and the debt, some of the addictions, some of the stuff that's going on in people's lives breaks your heart. And Sandra and I are asking ourselves that the Lord would break our heart for our neighbours again. I have a feeling he won't leave us on our knees. He'll call us to take some risks. And for me, it's a simple equation, really. And I hope this isn't too hard hitting. But, you know, if Christ would take such a risk for me and would ask, would act with such ridiculous courage because he believed that I was worth it and I'm nothing special about me, you know, it's true of all of us. Then why wouldn't I be willing to be interrupted or, you know, called out or take a risk with a neighbour in a conversation or take a risk with my holidays or my money because they're equally worth it. My neighbours in the tribute here and my, my neighbours in Europe and the Middle East and all around the world. 
I wonder if we could take a moment now to just be quiet for a moment or two and and ask ourselves um, a dangerous question and even perhaps turn it into a prayer. Lord, would you break my heart for the things that break your heart right now? Would you drive me to my knees? And would you lift me from my knees courageously to take the risks you'd call me to take? Let's be quiet for a moment, shall we? And then I'll pray for us. And Lord Jesus, we marvel again at the ridiculous, stunning, costly sacrifice that you paid for us. Emptying yourself of heaven to come to this earth to live in the mess that we've got. And then even dying on a cross, a painful death because we were worth it. And Lord, as, our, as part of our worship to you, as part of our response to you, would we be people that are willing to be interrupted people that are willing to have our hearts broken people that are willing to raise rise courageously to our feet to take the risks you would call us to take in all kinds of ways around the corner around the world with our time and our reputation and our money and whatever else you call it from us lord you're worth the risk you're worth it Help us to live up to the call and the example that you've set for us. Amen. John, that was awesome. Um, I have immediate, a bunch of thoughts that are going through my head. There was a, <clears throat> a gentleman has recently stepped down to take a new position at a church. Uh, and he shared the story about how he had heard the message from the pastor the year before out of Isaiah. I'm not sure what chapter it is this off the top of my head, but basically the young person, the person saying to God, said, yes, Lord, send me. I'm available. Put me in. And. He says, it's, he says, I just started praying that dangerous prayer, knowing what might lay on the other side. And um, this is just a continuation. I mean, you even mentioned, I mean, he sends it, says it right here in Nehemiah. And I forget what verse, I can't read it, but verse five, that you send me to Judah. Yeah. And so I appreciate this powerful message. Anybody else have anything that they'd like to add or question ask John on? I'd like to, uh, man, John, incredible, incredible challenge. Um, I'd, I'd just like to, uh, to mention uh, the 10-2 project. You know, John and myself and Mike Taylor and a whole bunch of other people have been talking about this off and on for several years. And, you know, you find, you find adults in their early stage of life, age 18 to 25 or six, uh, most, a lot of them are, a uh, lot of them are single and, and, or married and without kids. And so they're, you know, they're certainly a lot more portable than perhaps a 40 year old with children and so forth. But, you know, what about a 55 year old or a 60 year old? Yeah. Um, you know, our kids are gone. Karen's and my kids are gone. Uh, we have aging parents right now that we're having to deal with. And that, that's not a negative comment. Uh, but very soon, we're going to have no strings, nothing. And so what's the difference in us at age 60 than an adult age 22? Uh, in fact, we have much more wisdom. Uh, I wouldn't have believed her at age 22. So, I uh, mean... <laughs> I'd have been hanging around John at that soccer stadium, uh, chasing whatever, but, uh, man, just, you don't have to go to England for six, for six weeks, but 
why retire and play golf the rest of your life? Nothing wrong with golf. But why <laughs> retire and play golf the rest of your life when people all over the world need to hear the gospel of Christ? Absolutely. We're going we're gonna to put a proposal to Mike uh, pretty soon. Uh, we've asked 12 churches to pilot this um, tend to legacy piece, we're calling it. And we're going to ask 12 churches and we're going to give them a limited number of people each so we can trial it with people they know and trust and put them across. We'll do a, a week's training and then four weeks placement in one of our key cities, then a week wrap up at the end with some spiritual tour of Europe. And so it'll be an amazing six weeks. So, yeah, Mike, reach out to the guys when you know what your number is and what the dates are and, and please come and join us. We'd love it. And as, as you know, Charles will be on with us with you guys I think in a month's time and you can push into him and I think he's going to particularly talk about prayer and joining us in this 10-2 prayer initiative yeah